All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. We're going to, this is a series of talks on didactic uh, things in dermatopathology, and uh, these are set up to correlate with the didactic lectures that are going on at UT Southwestern. So uh, I think the UT guys are going to be getting this uh, from Travis Vandergriff, and then others can get it from uh, from these, but you're welcome to look at these if you're a UT resident, kind of hear it more than once with the Baylor and the Weatherford residents and any other residents around the United States or wherever want to listen to these are going to be recorded. So right now it's just basically me and, and a couple other people. So I'm going to hide the chat screen. If anybody has any chat uh, things they want to add, feel free to, to put those in. So I've got about, uh, I think it, uh, 12 cases we're going to kind of go through today. The theme, and these are thematic, um, are going to be psoriasiform dermatitis. And so um, the first of these, so all of these are, are basically inflammatory. You don't need to go through the algorithm of inflammatory versus neoplastic, that sort of thing. But you can see that this demonstrates a regular psoriasiform hyperplasia over a broad front. And uh, this is pretty prototypical of psoriasis. So we look at psoriasis. Uh, tends to give you these elongated epidermal recia. They tend to be the same length, and they get these thin suprapapillary plates, as you can see here. And then uh, in fully developed lesions, you'll get the mounds of parakeratosis with neutrophils, and sometimes you get little intracorneal uh, neutrophils like you see here. Uh, this would be like a Munro microabscess. And then if you get like a larger spongiform uh, pustule, uh, that's basically a spongiform pustule of Kagoi. So those are some other things that we see in, in psoriasis. I think we may have a picture of pustular psoriasis coming up here in a couple of minutes. But anyway, this is a prototypical example of psoriasis. Now, some other uh, things that you can look for that can help you, uh, sometimes you'll see suprabasilar mitoses like here. Uh, normally, it takes about six weeks for a keratinocyte to go from here to here. In psoriasis, that's about uh, 48 hours. So it's much uh, more uh, metabolically active. And uh, that's basically why the biologics and some of the anti-metabolite drugs we use work. So uh, nice example of psoriasis. Uh, there are a number of different other variants of psoriasis we're gonna talk about, but today we're talking mostly about pretty classic psoriasiform dermatitides. So uh, we're just gonna basically focus on that. So here's some clinical photographs, pretty classic psoriasis. These are some items in the differential diagnosis of psoriasis. These are all recorded, so I'm not going to read them to you. But basically, <clears throat> these are some of the classic features that we see. Uh, yes, usually you do see a loss of the granular cell layer. I didn't point that out, but that's another finding that's pretty characteristic. And this word here is not pronounced kogaj. That is pronounced like an I. So O-I, kogoi, in that situation. Okay, next biopsy. And notice here... Um, it's got three shaves, there we go. And uh, it shows psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis, but notice that it's not as prominent as we saw in the psoriasis case. We get kind of a blunted psoriasiform hyperplasia of the epidermis. And a lot of these epidermal recia here coalesce with one another. And that's actually fairly characteristic uh, of what we see when you get uh, kind of a slight psoriasiform dermatitis and, and pretty characteristic of pityriasis rubipilaris. But there's another finding in PRP that is, is classic, and you get the so-called checkerboard pattern of parakeratosis, where you get the alternating parakeratosis both vertically, alternates with, with uh, orthokeratosis, as well as horizontally. So if you kind of run the, uh, the pointer here this way, you see uh, parakeratotic nuclei, then it disappears and then it reappears again over here. So that's pretty characteristic of uh, PRP. And then if you kind of go north and south, uh, basically you can see that you get these wafers of parakeratosis and orthokeratosis and parakeratosis. So that's pretty classic for PRP. Also, you'll see follicular plugging. And uh, we got some of that over here. You get that same kind of cornified layer change that goes into the follicle. And then one other thing that you can see in PRP sometimes is some acantholysis. And there's a little bit of that here. So it's not as prominent as you see in things like uh, the acantholytic dyskeratotic disorders like derriers or pemphigus or things like that, but you can actually uh, see it uh, fairly commonly in PRP. So a uh, nice example of that, notice you get these fat 
blunted epidermal reshift. So we're going to look at a clinical photograph. Um, these show the nice follicular plugging. This was actually a patient that had HIV infection that had follicular plugging, had kind of an acne form eruption. Some other examples, you often get palmoplantar plantar involvement with islands of sparing, and then the spines coming out of the follicles, all pretty characteristic of, of PRP. And there's been six types of PRP described. Uh, some types are more atypical, but this is, we're not talking all the atypical variants today. We're talking about some of the, just mainly the classic things we see with PRP. Sometimes you can actually see some inflammation and even some eosinophils, interestingly enough, which is, uh, you wouldn't expect that in the psoriasis process, but you do see it in PRP on occasion. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about, uh, rotate it a little bit here. And uh, here we have a uh, shave biopsy again. It's always nice to get punch biopsies of inflammatory diseases here. They were probably not thinking about inflammatory process. They might've been thinking about a neoplasm. And you see we've got this very irregular psoriasis from hyperplasia here as opposed to psoriasis where we have the very regular psoriasis from hyperplasia. And notice if you're gonna markedly thicken cornified layer, this looks like something near volar skin. And you've got these hair follicles here. So when you just basically use logic, uh, anytime you get hair follicles and it looks like it comes from the palm or sole, by definition, it has to be rubbed. And so this is a manifestation of lichen simplex chronicus or parigonodularis. It's also in the family of the psoriasiform uh, hyper, uh, dermatitides because you get the psoriasiform hyperplasia of the epidermis and it's all due in this case to rubbing. So if you actually were to occlude this, take the patient and put them in a situation where they could not touch their skin, uh, it would be, would go away. And usually takes about uh, four to six weeks to go away in that situation. So uh, this is an example of uh, parigonodularis or lichen simplex chronicus. Um, if it just looks like a plaque, we call it lichen simplex chronicus, like over here. If it shows uh, a nodular configuration, then we, we call it parigonodularis, but it's basically the same process. Um, when you rub the skin, it can do a lot of different things. It can give you this pattern, can also give you a secondary rupture of hair follicles, and that's basically what you see with reactive perforating collagenosis or perforating folliculitis or with Curley's disease. So those conditions also require chronic trauma to the skin. So here's an example of one seen clinically. This is just lichen simplex chronicus here. And basically this just talks about some of the clinical features and the histologic features. So this gives you more irregular psoriasis from hyperplasia. So anytime you see what looks like a hair follicle and looks like it comes from volar skin, you're either a biopsy of a chimpanzee or a gorilla or you're a biopsy of lichen simplex chronicus. So pretty much diagnose that uh, by process of elimination. Now here we have another example of a psoriasis form dermatitis here. And this is a more interesting phenomenon here. This is not one you would know without any further information. But you can see that it does show a, a psoriasis from hyperplasia, but it, it's kind of blunted. It doesn't look uh, as prominent as we see in psoriasis. And it's also got some spongiosis in here. And in the uh, dermis, it's got an infiltrate of lymphocytes. And if we look carefully, we may even see a few eosinophils admixed in here. And what's going on here, this is an example of a patient that had psoriasis and was being treated with a biologic and they had some persistent psoriasiform areas that didn't respond to treatment. And when we put patients on biologics, um, a lot of their psoriasis will just pretty much go away, but there may be some areas that don't totally go away and, and you get these residual psoriasiform dermatitis like you see here. And quite, quite commonly it has some spongiosis and it's got more of a blunted psoriasis from hyperplasia. It doesn't have the prominent uh, regular psoriasis from hyperplasia that we see in classic psoriasis. It doesn't have as much of the thinning in the suprapapillary plates. Usually doesn't have as much parakeratosis. So it kind of really looks more like um, atopic dermatitis or like a spongiotic dermatitis. So it's not a classic pattern for psoriasis. So just realize that when you see um, psoriasis from dermatitis that's been treated with biologics, or maybe a patient has Crohn's disease or something like that and is placed on a biologic and develops a psoriasis from dermatitis. If you biopsy that, it's not gonna look like classic psoriasis. So uh, again, this is kind of an example of what one might look like, not the world's best uh, clinical example of it, 
but basically uh, you just get this sort of pink, slightly scaly eruption, and it's usually seen in association with uh, the TNF-alpha inhibitors. Uh, sometimes if patients get this, we'll recommend to their clinician that they might change to an IL-17 or IL-23 uh, inhibitor that sometimes uh, will maybe give a response to the condition in that situation that doesn't uh, uh, persist. And again, it's, it's usually seen with TNF-alpha inhibitors. Kind of looks more like atopic derm or maybe partially treated psoriasis of another sort. Okay, we're gonna take a look at this biopsy here. Um, this also commonly gives psoriasis from hyperplasia, not as much as here. Usually it's not as prominent psoriasis from hyperplasia, again, as we see with psoriasis, but it does demonstrate some psoriasis form features. And notice we've got a band-like infiltrate of lymphoid cells here, and even a low magnification, you can see that there are quite a few cells in the epidermis. And as we go to higher magnification, it's also got this very thick keloidal type collagen bundles in the papillary dermis. Anytime you get these markedly thickened collagen bundles with dilated blood vessels, that's a sign of chronicity. And this is an example of mycosis fungoides, patch stage MF that's been present for a long period of time. And you can get psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis in that condition sometimes. So you see some of that over here. But notice all of these cells in the epidermis and they don't really have to be all that atypical. If you just get a lot of uh, epidermotropism of these cells coupled with the band-like infiltrate, um, that's diagnostic of mycosis fungoides. And uh, some people uh, are reluctant to make the diagnosis of mycosis fungoides without doing a lot of special stains and junior arrangements and everything else. But in the context of clinical information, when you see this kind of picture, it's really diagnostic and you don't need a lot of additional studies and stains and whatnot to make the diagnosis. So this is a beautiful example of MF and just demonstrating that it is in the family of the psoriasis dermatitides and it can look very psoriasiform clinically as well. We get a lot of patients that, uh, that get misdiagnosed as psoriasis that actually have mycosis fungoides. So here you see an example, it kind of looks psoriasiform here. It's got these sort of unusual arsiform and quasi-annular plaques here. So it's not psoriasis, it's, it's mycosis fungoides. And when you take a biopsy of it, um, if you get a good classic pattern, it really looks, looks good for that. So uh, again, plaque stage, patch stage MF can look psoriasiform uh, under the microscope, but you're gonna get the uh, band-like infiltrate with all the cells in the epidermis. It does have a differential diagnosis of some of the things listed here. Uh, probably uh, one of the more difficult things to tell is sometimes pterorhizis ligonoides, but that usually gives you more uh, dyskeratosis and more parakeratosis. That's got some neutrophils in the cornified layer than you see with, with uh, plaque stage or patch stage mycosis fungoides. Okay, this is the next lesion we're gonna look at here. And uh, this gives you a uh, psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis, as you can see with low magnification. Unfortunately, a lot of these are shaved biopsies. It'd be really nice to get punch biopsies, but a lot of clinicians, unfortunately, aren't doing as many punch biopsies today. And uh, you can see that it gives a psoriasis form band-like infiltrate of cells. Um, some of these cells you can see at low magnification are a little bit lighter in color. So they're not all going to be lymphocytes. And as we go to higher magnification, again, you can see the nice psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis. It's not as regular as we see with psoriasis. Um, it's got parakeratosis, but doesn't have the nice mounds of parakeratosis with neutrophils that we see with psoriasis. And as we go to higher magnification, there are a lot of uh, histiocytes here and basically innumerable plasma cells. So this pattern, psoriasis form lichenoid dermatitis with histiocytes and plasma cells is classic for secondary symptoms. So if you see that pattern, it, it actually, if we had a punch biopsy, it would probably be superficial and deep psoriasis from lichenoid with lymphocytes, histiocytes, and plasma cells in it. Uh, and then with the psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis, pretty much secondary syphilis until proven otherwise. But it can look a lot like psoriasis. I mean, I've seen some cases that get a lot of neutrophils in the cornified layer. I notice the absence of the granular cell layer. That's in common with psoriasis. So uh, syphilis really and truly can be the great imitator. Uh, can simulate psoriasis. We have all this uh, degree of inflammation with the plasma cells and histiocytes. You really wouldn't, shouldn't think about it that, uh, that strongly, but uh, it is a, uh, sometimes it can simulate psoriasis pretty closely and can sometimes simulate it on a clinical basis. So these clinical photographs here uh, really don't look anything like psoriasis, a classic sort of papular squamous eruption with involvement of the palms and soles, the copper pennies and the, the ham colored uh, lesions on the palms and soles with a scale pretty classic for secondary syphilis, uh, and that histologic pattern is pretty classic for it as well. 
So uh, again, plasma cells, uh, there are a few things in dermatology that are pretty much consistent. Uh, you do usually see at least a few plasma cells in secondary syphilis. Uh, I've seen some patterns in which there's almost no inflammation at all. Look carefully and you see occasional plasma cells. So uh, just remember that uh, plasma cells very commonly seen in secondary syphilis, but you don't have to have a, a ton of them. Okay, let's take a look at this one here. Again, notice that it's a psoriasis from dermatitis. Um, not as florid as we see with psoriasis, but does show a psoriasis form dermatitis here. Um, and it's got the little mounds of perikeratosis with the superficial perivascular lymphocytes. So it's, uh, it's not a, a florid psoriasis from dermatitis like we see in psoriasis, but it does show psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis. And psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis is a reaction pattern that we see in a lot of different conditions. So we obviously see it in psoriasis, but we can see it in, again, some of these other things we talked about. And this is an example of uh, pityriasis rosea uh, in this case. And PR usually doesn't give you this much psoriasis from hyperplasia. So this is a florid lesion of PR. Might have come from the Herald patch. Um, uh, patients uh, that have darker skin, African Americans, tend to give more florid manifestations of PR when they develop it. And so they can get more psoriasis from hyperplasia, they can get more spongiosis and more inflammation. So the classic pattern of PR is a superficial perivascular dermatitis with slight spongiosis with, with some extravasated erythrocytes. And we actually do have a few extravasated erythrocytes here. Uh, with spongiosis, but this biopsy shows that it can sometimes give you some more psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis um, than you can see in, uh, more in some of the classic, more typical appearances of pityriasis rosa. So just realize that psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis uh, can be seen in a lot of different conditions, so it is a reaction pattern. So just every time you see it, don't instantly think about psoriasis, put some of these other items in the differential diagnosis. And you all know what PR looks like. It gives you the classic Herald patch with the widespread papulosquamous uh, lesions, the little macules and, 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 and small patches, plaques on the trumping extremities in that classic Christmas tree type of pattern that we see. And we do know this is induced by human uh, herpes virus uh, type six, we believe now in most cases. So this is a nice example. Can sometimes look a little like guttate psoriasis. If you biopsy the herald patch, it can really look like a superficial lymphocytic infiltrate. And you can get variable amounts of spongiosis, usually just a slight amount of spongiosis, but sometimes in some more florid cases, you get a few little spongiotic microvesicles. So we're going to kind of move to a couple of uh, other areas where you can see psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis. So this is again a non psoriasis it's a psoriasis from dermatitis, but here we get more prominent spongiosis. And this is on the volar skin surface. And so notice we've got psoriasis from hyperplasia, a little bit irregular with a small spongiotic microvesicle in the epidermis. And so this is an example of dishydrotic dermatitis. And this can simulate psoriasis on volar skin quite closely. So it can be very difficult to distinguish psoriasis on volar skin and dishydrotic dermatitis, as well as some of the other spongiotic dermatitides that can involve the palms and soles, like contact and numbing dermatitis, well, especially contact dermatitis. Numbing dermatitis usually doesn't involve palms and soles, but contact, dishydrotic, and, and psoriasis and tinea can all look pretty similar. So just realize you're going to need good clinical correlation. At the end of the day, sometimes it's really difficult to tell dishydrotic dermatitis and psoriasis. You may just have to kind of treat them uh, similarly. And, and maybe in some cases you use maybe a biologic for psoriasis. And if it doesn't work, then maybe try one of the biologics that work for some of the spongiotic conditions. So uh, just remember these things can look pretty similar, but they can give you the nice psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis. One clue that I find that's helpful when you're dealing with psoriasis on volar skin versus the uh, dishydrotic dermatitis is if you get tiered areas of perikeratosis over a broad front, that tends to favor psoriasis. Um, dishydrotic dermatitis doesn't quite give you as much perikeratosis as you see with psoriasis. So with this much spongiosis, um, this much uh, irregular psoriasis microplasia, uh, you can get neutrophils in the spongiotic foci in both, but it's a little less common in dishydrotic that would favor dishydrotic dermatitis uh, in this situation. So a uh, nice example of that here. So again, another condition, not psoriasis, where you get psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis. And this is obviously what you see in, in pretty classic dishydrotic dermatitis, the tapioca uh, little vesicles on the sides of the fingers and on the palms and soles. Uh, 
So just remember those two can look <coughs> pretty similar <coughs> histologically. And you may have to kind of correlate that with clinical and in some cases you may just have to uh, <coughs> treat them similarly. So these can all look pretty similar uh, under the microscope. <coughs> okay, the next biopsy is taken from near uh, mucous membrane. So this is, uh, again, a psoriasiform, uh, not dermatitis, but mucositis. And we get a uh, uh, intraepithelial collection of all these neutrophils. So this is an intraepithelial neutrophilic dermatosis. And uh, the differential diagnosis of this pattern includes neutrophils in the epidermis, an infection such as tinea, possibly a bacterial infection, but usually more of a fungal infection, or candida. A mucous membrane, obviously, a candidiasis would be more common. And then uh, the variants of psoriasis, pustular psoriasis lesions that, that involve the mucous membrane. So geographic tongue, and this lesion did come from the tongue. And this is an example of, of what geographic tongue looks like. And it looks identical to pustular, pustular psoriasis that you see on the glabrous skin, only it's located uh, on the mucous membrane. So other conditions where you get mucous membrane pustules uh, Rider's disease, I can give you mucous membranes in the palms, in the mucous mem membranes as well as the, the glabrous skin. Uh, so the variants of psoriasis can give you pustular eruptions, can also involve mucous membranes, and, and geographic tongue is one of those. So I tend to lump these uh, conditions together. They pretty much all look the same under the microscope. But notice that you've got the, uh, the nice psoriasiform hyperplasia here of the mucous membrane surfaces. So again, this is an example of uh, a psoriasiform process with intraepithelial neutrophils seen in the mucous membrane site. So uh, if you had something like this, you would really be obligated to make sure that there wasn't a uh, coincidental fungal infection. Uh, this is what uh, geographic tongue looks like on a, uh, in a patient. And uh, it's got this beautiful, classic kind of geographic morphology to it. So when you biopsy this, you're going to see intraepithelial neutrophils like we just saw on the histology. So Generally, it uh, gives you these demarcated patches on the tongue. and you biopsy, it kind of looks pretty similar to uh, pustular psoriasis on glabrous skin. Okay, now speaking of psoriasis on, uh, on the skin, let's take a look at an example of pustular psoriasis. And uh, here we're looking at, again, uh, acral skin. So we just had dyshydrotic dermatitis. Well, here we've got acral skin once again, and we've got a spongiform pustule. So spongiform means that it looks like spongiosis. And again, if you look at the edge over here, you can see it looks like a little sponge here and a spongiform pustule because it's got all these neutrophils in here. So if you want to say this is a spongiform pustule of Kagoi once again, you're welcome to do that. Um, and this is an example, it's a classic example of what we see when we biopsy uh, a, a lesion of pustular psoriasis on acral skin. And notice here, as opposed to the dyshydrotic dermatitis case we had before, we've got prominent psoriasiform hyperplasia here. Very long, thin epidermal recia, thin superpapillary plates. We've still got the thick cornified layer because we're on volar skin. And then we've got this nice, well demarcated pustule over here. And uh, off to the side, we've got some parakeratosis. So if we just had this area right here, looks pretty much like psoriasis on another location in the body. But then you've got the nice spongiform pustule over here going along with that. Notice the nice uh, dilated tortuous blood vessels, um, the loss of the granular cell layer. So if you have these changes here on volar skin, you can make the diagnosis of psoriasis. So here we would not hedge this diagnosis and say the differential diagnosis includes dyshydrotic dermatitis. Here we would say this is pustular psoriasis, slam dunk, you don't need to hedge it when you got all these findings here. Uh, you might want to do a PAS stain, but when you got stuff like this, it's pretty classic. So these are examples of pustular psoriasis. This is not on volar skin, but you biopsy a lesion of pustular psoriasis gives you those intraepidermal pustules like that. Uh, usually they're not involving follicles. And uh, sometimes the pustular psoriasis get widespread. You get this von Zumbusch uh, pustular psoriasis where patients can get really sick. They can get high output cardiac failure. So if you get a bad case of pustular psoriasis, it doesn't really need to get treated uh, pretty quickly. So uh, again, Welcome to read this on your own. Uh, so a lot of different variants of pustular psoriasis can involve uh, acral skin, can involve uh, riders where you get the uh, arthritis and 
the involving the uh, mucous membranes, the genital areas are commonly involved, uh, but looks pretty classic uh, for what I just showed you under the microscope when you get a good example of that um, histologically. Here's another example, a shave biopsy once again, unfortunately, but uh, this is from uh, skin near the face. And this doesn't show a lot of psoriasis microplasia, it's got a little bit, but it's got these mounds of perikeratosis right at the edges of the follicular osteo. So here uh, does not have a prominent amount of psoriasis microplasia, but sometimes we do see more florid psoriasis microplasia in this condition. And this is seborrheic dermatitis. And when the psoriasis microplasia gets really prominent, it can sometimes simulate psoriasis histologically. And uh, when we see that, we'll often call it SIBO psoriasis. And so uh, there can sometimes be some overlap between psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis. Classic pattern is this usually relatively slight psoriasis microplasia with the mounds of perikeratosis that really like the area just adjacent to the follicular osteo like this. So when you see a mound of perikeratosis with a little bit of neutrophils in it, uh, right at the edges, the lips of the follicular osteo, that's just classic for severed dermatitis. And then you'll usually get a little bit of psoriasis microplasia, uh, usually not quite to the degree that we see with psoriasis. If we start getting a lot of it, we may refer to it as SIBO psoriasis. We usually can tell these apart. And clinically, they're pretty classic also. You get the scale and the nasolabial folds, the eyebrow area, the, the frontal areas of the scalp. And sometimes you get kind of an inverse subderm uh, underneath the breast and the trunk, those areas. And, you know, in severe dermatitis, we know it can be associated with other, other conditions, uh, Parkinson's disease, people with neurologic disorders, uh, and then patients that have HIV infection can get uh, severe dermatitis. So it um, can look like psoriasis sometimes, does give you relatively, does can give you some psoriasis from hyperplasia, uh, usually not quite as much as psoriasis, but again, it is in the differential diagnosis of, uh, of psoriasis and psoriasis from dermatitis. Okay, now the last one of these we're going to do today, um, and again, we, uh, there's a lot of things that are covered in the psoriasis from chapter uh, we're just going to hit some of the high points of these today. Uh, one thing we probably should include at some point is atopic dermatitis because that can look a lot like psoriasis also, especially when it's been rubbed. Uh, but it can be in the same general family as the spongiotic dermatitis. Here's a, an acute spongiotic dermatitis with psoriasis from hyperplasia. And this is an example of acute allergic contact dermatitis. And that also, especially more chronic contact dermatitis, especially when patients have been rubbing their skin and getting a lot of lichen simplex chronicus, can get even more psoriasis from hyperplasia than we see here. But notice we've got psoriasis from hyperplasia of the epidermis. We've got areas of spongiosis and the spongiosis in, uh, atop, in, in allergic contact dermatitis usually contains lymphocytes and eosinophils, uh, rarely neutrophils, but usually uh, will give you eosinophils and, uh, and lymphocytes. And here we've got a lot of eosinophils inside the spongiotic focus here. And then another area where there's some small in incipient spongiotic microvesicles developing. So this is a pretty florid example of allergic contact dermatitis. This, this is the kind of thing you see with people that have poison ivy. They come in with blisters on their skin when they get these, these amounts of uh, spongiosis that you see here. But this, the, the more, the, the acute spongiotic dermatitis uh, gives you a lot of small vesicles like you see here, a really florid, fully developed lesion, give you these frank spongiotic microvesicles like you see here. And then the late uh, allergic contact dermatitis will give you less spongiosis and more irregular psoriasis from hyperplasia due to the chronic itching, scratching, rubbing that they get into uh, when you're dealing with a chronic spongiotic process, say like a nickel dermatitis or, or something like that. So uh, here's a person that had poison ivy. And if you biopsy that, that's gonna kind of look like this biopsy where you get the nice frank uh, vesicles in the skin. So uh, again, early, a lot of spongiosis, later, less spongiosis. And these tend to be more linear and kind of give you these geometric uh, patterns to them. And uh, so again, uh, more spongiotic uh, dermatitis with the eosinophils than you would expect to see with psoriasis. A couple other things, the different diagnosis, uh, bug bites, uh, drug reactions, things of that nature can simulate uh, spongiotic dermatitis, can simulate uh, contact dermatitis as well, and sometimes can give you some uh, some psoriasis from hyperplasia. So that's a nice overview uh, of uh, the spongiotic psoriasis from dermatitis, psoriasis from dermatitis.
Uh, there's others. Uh, so this is not a comprehensive review of everything. So I encourage you to read the chapter on this. Uh, if you uh, we'll, we'll do some unknown slides and we'll cover some of these things on as well. So it's an important topic to know and it's one of the more common things that we see in uh, dramatic pathology. So I uh, recommend again that you really bone up on this because there comes in the differential diagnosis quite a bit when we're dealing with inflammatory dermatoses. So at that point, we're going to stop for today and we'll pick up another uh, session next uh, week. Uh, and we'll record these. You're welcome to read, look at them uh, at any time. And uh, hope you enjoyed the session and uh, look forward to seeing it in a future, future talk.